Hello, everybody. I didn't check any of my audios. Okay, we're, we're good. We're good. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Werewolf the Apocalypse, the book of hungry names. Uh, I've been told that we're in the final stretch now of the game, but there's still quite a bit to go. So that's fun for everyone. <laughs> Me especially. Hopefully I'll get this finished before um, Vampire the Masquerade Reckoning of New York comes out, but we'll see. We'll see how fast I can read. Not very fast. Uh, last time we, we solved the problem of the moth things. Um, it was a weird hedge wizard scientist guy doing it. Um, and also we stopped the plague, but not before our boss and the journalist person friend that we had, Nomi, uh, died of the plague. Uh, we did save the antiquarian at Rosemary Street and we completely cleared Rosemary Street of corruption so yay for us, I guess, <laughs> you know, got to take the good with the bad. Um, and now we're trying to get to the Broadbrook Cairn. We've done all the things. We got rid of the Cult of Fenris, but we got to get rid of the Black Spiral Dancer Eater of Names. And so we're like, we're going to go to the Cairn. Totally. That's what we're going to do. Um, put this on repeat because I forgot to. And so we do, me and Podge heading up to the cairn, scoping it out, checking it out, and we run into, or we see, um, Eater of Names getting out of an ATV. So that's fun, and that's where I stopped it, um, because I <laughs> was skilled. Uh, but now we're going to jump right back in. So here we go. The Black Spiral Dancer is in his Hamid form, all distinguished late middle age and well-coiffed silver hair. He's dressed in a long black coat and a gray scarf, and he's in the middle of a phone conversation. Last of the girders are in place. We have Kemod's armor and everything of Dr. Vandegrift's I was able to find. The black sun, no. Giselle is still active, but I'm not afraid of her. We're ready. Something from the other end, an eater of names stares up at the sky for a moment. How should I know? The black spiral dancer snaps. He's not just any Bane, but I've had enough of his demands. The whole fucking city isn't enough? The answering tiger can't have the cairn. We have to destroy it, at least partially to show that we can. Stop whining, Ben. Don't you want to die for real? That's what I'm offering. I'll, yes, I'll let you die. I promise. I owe you that much. You have my word, Ben. Spider-Man's uncle? <laughs> Podge draws a revolver, but flunkies surround the Black Spiral Dancer. No clean shot, especially at this range, until he disappears into the building. You can reach the site. You don't have reception out here, but your phone's camera works, so you can take more pictures until the Arun says, I hear ATV engines. We gotta go. You retreat back to Podge's truck with a veritable trove of data. Ida of names and answering Taiga on exactly seeing eye to eye, it sounds like, Podge says. That was your impression, too. Interesting. You work a double shift at... Oh, that's right. We had to get a new job because our boss died. So, And also our boss's boss, who's obviously a vampire, but we thought he was a robot, uh, clearly succumbed to the beckoning. So we got a job at a coffee shop called Byzance. You work a double shift at Byzance because Pemb has been vanishing all week and you have to interview new baristas. It's hard to complain about that, though, since you need more hands for whenever there's a rush. You finish cleaning and you're about to head home, bone-tired, when you get a text. Coffee Queen. Emergency prep for event tomorrow, Academy of Music. Oh, come on. Another all-nighter? On the other hand, that last one paid great and you met all sorts of interesting people. And your date with Podge fell through because he had to bail one of his unhoused buddies out of jail. You squeeze Pem for information, especially about payment, and after some hedging and some threats, she agrees to a minimum payment of $500 with work finished by 9 a.m. tomorrow. You hop on your bike and head for the Academy of Music. Traction is difficult. It snowed last night. It's bitterly cold and the wind slices right through your poncho. You regret not wearing the new cardigan black tarn knit for you. You're careful to avoid City Hall with its now permanent garrison of police collecting overtime. There must be at least 20 of them, some of them armed with army surplus weaponry. Okay, that's fun. How much damage has the garrison done to local businesses? Such a good question. Hello? Ben knows he has to die for Spider-Man to exist, right? Exactly. Uh... Oh, good. I love, you know, you know what I love? Uh, friggin', um, uh, what is the word? That's not the, that's not what I'm looking for. I always get the weirdest things when I attempt when I attempt to do this live for some reason I never get the, the thing properly I 
No. <laughs> I do not know why it does not give me the option to do what I want to do. Which is ban this user. <laughs> it's very irritating that I don't have the option to do it. It's because I'm on the wrong screen, I think. Yes, I know. That was that was a misclick. My bad. It's because I have to go to another screen to do this. That because that's silliness. That's silliness if I have to go to another screen to do this. I think I do. Uh, give me one second. I have to go to a different. I have to go on to my my own my own stream to do it because I can't do it from this screen. I don't know why. I had that problem before where there was another bot. I have to go over to this screen and do it. Good God! Except it's not showing up for. Oh, okay, this is this is just this is just my life. All right, let's do it manually then. Let's just do it manually. There we go. Sorry, I have to do it weird on this screen <laughs> instead of doing it the way I want to do it from the regular screen. Uh, okay. What was I talking about? I completely, completely forgot what I was talking about. Doesn't really matter. It's been a complete disaster. The bubble tea place, the falafel place, the fancy wine and cheese place all shut down because they can't get any business. I just realized, I just realized now why I can't do it from this screen. It's because I have a shield mode on on this screen and I have on this, on this, the stream manager and I have to figure out how to shut that off because I didn't put it up there. <laughs> I just remember, I like, I'll keep, keep it's all I was doing was thinking like, why can't I ban people directly by hitting the ban button? And it's because I have a, have a shield thing on here and I have to take that off. The bubble tea place, the falafel place, the fancy wine and cheese place all shut down because they can't get any business. The hippie church next door lodged a formal complaint and the minister was immediately arrested. No one has seen her in weeks. And of course the Academy of Music has been struggling. Hard to put on shows with cops breathing down your neck. You've never been inside the Academy of Music before, and Nin got free tickets to a concert once, but the show conflicted with your launch, a full-scale assault on GRC media plans. So Trevor got to go instead. The Academy is in the middle of town, next to Pulaski Park, and its semi-permanent protester encampment, and you're familiar with its Renaissance revival facade and blood-red neon sign. No show tonight, and the front doors are locked. You don't want to approach from an angle the police can see, so you circle around back and find an open door that leads to a half-lit service corridor cluttered with unorganized Hollywood... Hollywood. Holiday direct de decorations. You can hear some banging around inside. Your phone boops. I don't like this person. I miss um, Mr. Vice already. Everything you need is on stage. Go set up and I'll be there soon. Do not make mistake. Pems showing up too? This must be a big deal. You head through the backstage areas until you emerge into the tatty but elegant floor of the theater. Maroon seats, plush carpets, gold trim everywhere. A single spotlight illuminates the heavy closed door curtains. You don't know what sets you off, but your hackles rise. Something is wrong. You can hear Pem clomping around behind the stage, but there's something else you can't place. A tension in the air that you've come to recognize after too many ambushes and betrayals. You don't have your weapons, you realize. Um... Could be an ambush using owl and what I know of firearms. Do I know anything of firearms? I don't think so. I check the exits and sight lines to avoid getting caught. 
You're down below with the groundlings, and your biggest concern is that you can't see the upper levels, which are shrouded in darkness. A sharpshooter could set up there and put one of those big silver-tipped crossbow bolts into you. You edge around the stage, sticking to the abundant patches of darkness, and slip behind the curtains to emerge between some folding metal chairs and a box of paper mache stage props. Here you'll be able to tell if anyone is coming your way. An exit sign reveals the way out or a way in for police or Neo Albion. You look up, the catwalks above you are empty. You don't think you're going to get crushed by a falling sandbag like in an old mystery novel. That's when the lights come up. Yay, God. Eater of Names floats overhead. His face is a mirror so that you see only your face and the helmet globe. So here we are again, Sierra, the black spiral dancer says, floating over the folding chairs. Again, you ask, eyes scanning the armored spacesuit for information. I live in at least two worlds, Eater of Names says. In one, I am defeated and on the run. That desperation has honed my skills, made me deadly and cunning. Here I have already won. I need only finish destroying the cairn to conclude my great work. My predecessor, Breaker of Wings, understood the power of prediction and modeling. At least he did before you fucking Garu killed him at Vermont Yankee. I have had this conversation with you, Elton, Melody, Clay, werewolves you've never met. And I have disappointing news for you, Sierra. Of all those werewolves, you were always the weakest. <laughs> uh, you know what? I believe that so hard. So I have chosen to start here with you. So is this what you use the answering tiger for to make predictions like a big computer? Hello, welcome in. <laughs> um, yes, I am Gaia's deadliest weasel and weakest weasel. The answering tiger is a god, Sierra, the floating werewolf says. He can create whole worlds. But once the Broadbrook Garu killed themselves, I no longer needed the false world in which they won. A few scraps remain, but now I use the answering tiger's imaginative faculties to see the future. And I have bad news about your odds. You don't walk away from this one, I'm afraid. But you're still talking, you say. Is he trying to get information out of you? I enjoy talking, Eater of Name says. His tone says he's offended that you would ever think otherwise. I do what I do because I know it's right, but it's also hard. My fellow werewolves are some of the few people who see what I see, but then they close their eyes and pretend Gaia is still alive despite everything they know. And they try to stop me, unaware that it's too late and I have to kill them. I'm not asking for your pity, but you have to understand that this is lonely work. Green radiance burns from his gauntlets as Eater of Names descends to obliterate you. You hear booted feet overhead, police or Neo Albion, you can't tell. And you don't have any weapons. You could attack in your Krenos form, but it would take both strength and iron nerves to fight past the green flames. That's me! <laughs> do theaters still use sandbags? Can I drop a sandbag on him or does that only work in the movies? Well, I'm a ragabash, so obviously I have to find out. Just because it's true doesn't mean you should say it, eater of names. I don't right. <laughs> Don't try to insult me by, by lobbing facts at me. This theater, at least, still uses counterweights to po open the curtain and move some of the larger props. There's some kind of paper mache balcony above you, as well as catwalks and a huge plastic moon. While you're not sure if modern sandbags are full of sand, you weren't a theater kid. They're definitely full of weight. Dropping one on Eater of Names probably won't hurt him, but it will slow him down. Of course, you'd have to be clever to find the exact right rope to cut with your knife. Um, all right, I changed it to my cream. Okay. Let's do it. Let's drop a sandbag on Eater of Names. Let's do it. I'm ready. I'm so ready. This is really bad. This is so stupid. This is the stupidest thing you could do. So let's do it. You dodge a bolt of green flame, calculating as quickly as you can, then step into the shadows, forcing Eater of Names to follow you. He snarls and raises both clawed gauntlets. That's when you hack through a thick rope with your knife. The Black Spiral Dancer looks up as a sandbag falls, like a cartoon. It zips past him to land on the floorboards with a little whoomph. <laughs> Oh, please, Sierra, leader of names says. Stage magician tricks? Our power is real, Sierra. You should try using it. And before you can flee, the Black Spiral Dancer's blazing fist slams down onto your shoulders, knocking you to the ground. <laughs> Never has Sierra been so Sierra. You're not dead, but you don't feel great. I, just don't, I mean, what a mood. 
<laughs> as you stumble upright, your police boots are blackened and slimy as if you grabbed a live wire and the electricity grounded through your feet. You expect Eater of Names to strike again right away, but something makes him hesitate. Elton and Black Tarn both howl. You know the sounds. They're running over rooftops from Main Street around the police blockade around City Hall towards the Academy of Music. But they can't reach you before the Black Spiral Dancer attacks again. So why does Eater of Names hesitate? Stripes crawl over the walls. The only thing worse than facing a Black Spiral Dancer alone is facing the Dancer and his horrible god alone. And you glance at the exits again. But it's Eater of Names who hesitates and floats backwards. What's he planning? Or, you let yourself hope, what's he afraid of? You are a set that contains itself, Hiram. A cool, faintly accented voice says. Faintly accented? I can do German. You think you've heard it before, but you can't place it. You understand how messed up, right? The voice laughs, high and ferociously cruel. You use the answering tiger to calculate the weakest of the six Garu. You use the tiger to look out into all these possible futures to figure out how to win. And then you stepped out into the real world to enact your will. Or will. <laughs> or did you? The voice asks. Look around. Is this the real theater? Is that the real Sierra? You don't even know what's real anymore. I'm dead, but so are you. The stripes writhe and spasm, and then a small pale woman in a blue dress that scrapes along the ground materializes in front of Eater of Names. I was it's Elton's wife. Catherine stands before the floating black spiral dancer without a trace of fear. Her long hair blows wildly in the noxious radioactive wind of the balefire. Black shadows stream from her fingertips. What the hell is this? Eater of Names says, his voice breaking. You're just a shadow. Of course I am. You killed me, motherfucker. Catherine screams as butterflies and daisies boil out of the air around her. You killed everyone. The Black Spiral Dancer recovers some of his poise. Ah, yes, I was clever, wasn't I? Eater of Names says, using the answering tiger to convince all of you that you were defeating an army of monsters even as you died, letting you believe that you were holding a miracle, not a monster, and then making sure none of you would cause trouble by trapping you in an illusion where everyone lived where you won. Not everyone lived, even in the lie you made for me after my death, Catherine says. You were smart enough not to make our victory too saccharine, too obviously false. But after I commissioned that portrait of my dead husband, I started noticing little incongruities, little things that didn't add up. I know I'm dead, Hiram. I know I'm trapped in the dreams of a fallen god. But I know one more thing. I know you shouldn't have picked a fight in a theater. Why would you fight in a place dedicated to making false things seem true? You can't know anything, Eater of Names roars. You're nothing but a shadow. You idiot, you still don't understand, Catherine says. You thought you could trap us in the answering tiger's false reality. You thought you could use the tiger to construct possible futures for you so you could figure out exactly how to win. Don't you see the problem with a god that can do both those things, you colossal fucking fool? She throws her hands out wide. You don't know if this is real. You can't see the Black Spiral Dancer's face, but you see the horror in his body language, in the way his gauntlets, still wreathed with bellfire, twitch helplessly the way his shoulders cave in on, on themselves. Lightning starts to dance between Catherine's fingers. Damn. Damn. Go, 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 ghost. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so if this is a showdown between you guys, is it cool if I just take off? Sierra's such a loser. <laughs> This is more of an, oh god, epistemological discussion, Sierra, Catherine says as darkness wreathes her left hand. So I'd appreciate it if you hang around, mostly because I'm curious about who's going to kick that door down. Is it my dead husband because he's not dead here? Is it that storm cat or the falcon of doors? I'm pretty sure one of our cairn spirits died, but I can't remember which. And neither can you, Hiram. Maybe it'll be Scarper from New York or someone from one of the Cape Cod packs. I don't know about you, eater of names, but I can't be sure because you fucked up so badly that we don't know where we are. Is this one of Answering Tiger's predictive models? Is it the real world where you're pursuing your great victory? Do you even know? Eater of Names snarls and lunges with his burning gauntlet at Catherine, but the Shadow Lord just ducks like a boxer, slapping his arm away with her lightning-wreathed open palm. He yowls just as a side door in the audience seating bangs open. Elton and Black Tarn run for the stage, then freeze. Catherine, Elton says. 
Catherine's blue eyes widen with surprise and joy, but then her expression darkens. Obviously not, she says. I'm dead. You killed me. You can see that they want to say something to each other, but into that silence comes Eater of Name's cruel laughter. You stalled for time, Catherine, he says. Clever. But if Elton and Black Tarn are here, that means we're in the real world, and that means I can finish what I came here to do. He lunges at you, fist burning. Catherine turns and intercepts him with her lighting, light, lighting, lightning, I think it's supposed to be lightning, lightning wreathed right hand and the explosion blasts you onto the floorboards near the rear exit. Black Tarn was too far away to be caught in the blast radius and Elton has raised his spirit wards, but Eater of Names hovers over Catherine as she retreats. His helmet has shattered and melted away, but his lined face beams with triumph as the cuts on his face heal. There's a hole in the false stage sky overhead with its plastic stars, a churning black-green rift. Green black rift. You don't want to look too closely in case that's the answering tiger himself, but you can feel the flames drifting down in ribbons and see them wrapping around the black spiral dancer's gauntleted hands. Then the flames explode outwards. Eater of Names howls as if he's lost control of his gift. Maybe he has. Maybe the answering tiger is in charge now, but you don't have time to work through the metaphysics as the green flames crawl across the stage planks. Um. Ooh. Ooh. I'm going to save. Um, okay. Okay. So this is sort of a thing where like I gotta save everybody. So I could like say everyone run and hope everyone survives. Catherine's dead. She has answers, but I don't. I'm like so. I like so huge question marks about Catherine that I wouldn't trust her anyway. Black Tarn, I love her so much, but she is old. She should have taken the ride of the Winter Wolf by now. Um, so I'm going to attempt to save Elton. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can. You can see his spiritual defenses struggling to protect Elton against the Balefire. Elton is clever and deadly in a fight, but he relies too much on static defenses rather than mobility. Look out, you shout, as a tendril of green fire slips past El Elton's defenses and rushes forward like a serpent. You knock him out of the way just as the green bolt slams into you. The blast is just slightly off center, so your poncho ignites, but not your skin. <laughs> nice. Still, the force of the blast propels you into the stage wall with bone-breaking force. Your skull fractured, you lose consciousness. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's because I didn't... It's because I'm still in Hobbit form. <laughs> right? You have taken aggravated damage that prevents you from... Oh, I'm in Glabro form. I'm still in Glabro form. Three rage. I'm not doing super great. You snap back to consciousness, roll over, and throw up black filth. Elton is moving around somewhere nearby, but all you can do now is vomit. Your throat burns, and one of your ribs didn't heal right. You have to work on it later. At least your skull is mostly intact. What happened? You try to ask anyone who's still around, but it comes out as a groan. Spittle drools from your jaw. Hot. Oh no, Elton says. Hurts less when you're already dead, Catherine says. Lucky for you, Black Tarn croaks. Their bodies are both burned beyond recognition. Whoa. Re burned beyond regeneration, excuse me. Eater of names is gone. Merc mercifully, so is the answering tiger. Gah, crap. The filth, Elton says. You can hear them even inside the building. Time to go. For you two, Catherine says. Not me. What? Elton says. He's taken Catherine's hand, but she's not moving. Elton, I'm dead, Catherine says. I'm a fragment of consciousness that Eater of Names trapped inside the Answering Tiger. And I've spent five years in a false reality where everyone is happy and everyone won except me because you died. For a moment, you can see the intense love she bears for Elton, but then her blue eyes narrow and she's all business again. <clears throat> but how are you here even a little bit? I want to understand the spiritual underpinnings of what happen of what's happening. Yes, please. Just Just a crumb of understanding would be fantastic. The painting, obviously. Oh, yeah, that's right. Duh. <laughs> I'm a moron. Paintings. Until you dropped Elton's, of course. The answering tiger, like all gods, however debased, can make worlds. He can make false things true. But if asked to work on things that are false in reality, the separation between what's true and false breaks down. An eater of names, that giant idiot, calculated that the best place to kill you was... She gestures theatrically towards the hanging props. Catherine speaks with the same absolute authority as Elton does, but Elton speaks that way even when he doesn't know what he's talking about. You can't be sure if Catherine is sure or just confident. But I can't stay, Catherine says. I'm not real. I need to get back. 
It hurts to remain in the real world with you. She looks away from Elton, shakes her head. Then she just fades away. Elton's checked out. So you take the lead circling around town and then heading back to the flat. Main Street is in chaos. From what you can see, the police around City Hall have barricaded the street and have stopped the fire truck that's trying to reach the Academy of Music. The fire there isn't spreading, but you can see smoke. As you watch, the cops start arresting firefighters, dragging them off the truck and flinging them onto the frozen asphalt. Nin is bundled up on the roof, singing Diamonds and Rust by Joan Baez and watching the cops. Art, Elton mutters. He's bandaged your burns, but those rancid flames will take days to heal from. You turn from the window to Catherine's portrait. Do you really think art can help us reach the cairn? You ask, studying the blinking Christmas lights around his window. His thoughts are obviously elsewhere on his once again dead wife. You start to answer, but Elton says, We'll need to speak with Lucinda the next chance we get. I'm going to recheck the wards tonight. You stay the night and wake up exhausted. You learn from Podge that Pemb is now a member of the Provincial Expanded Council, her reward for betraying you. Well... I need another job again. <laughs> also, you're fired. <laughs> After an unpleasant discussion about finances, your fellow Garu agreed to scrounge for money. You brought in the most money of the pack, or sometimes the second most after Nin, and everyone is suddenly a little nervous. Elton is selling off his treasures, but now he starts to treat it like a business, not a stopgap, and even starts making purchases. Soon he opens a small, by appointment only shop in his flat, full of extremely expensive occult artifacts that are nonetheless safe for humans to handle. Elton keeps expecting Melody to condescend, but the Philodox is part of the human world too, even if she lives in the ruins of the Garu Nation, and she agrees to look for work, thank God, for you, not for her, trying to make Melody work is cruel to her and her eventual victims. Some other good news, Melody has dug up some old deeds to properties around the valley, and while they're not worth much, she's able to shift some money your way. You're now slightly ahead of repairs and maintenance on your old ruin of a house. <laughs> Whatever. A few more days slip by as you focus on patrols and watch your bank account tick down. <laughs> Been there. Then you get an email from D Paul Beninsky of Acetone Industries. You remember meeting Polly with Melody last winter. That was back when the two of you were investigating the monsters you thought were Fomori, but that turned out to be the Teufel's Hand. Mr. Beninsky actually has a job for you. Oh, sweet. It's partly remote too. double checking raw material costs. At first, you have no idea what he's talking about. But when you check out some of the reading material, you get it. Acetone reviews raw and partially finished materials from all over the world. The entire com economy isn't hype and crypto. Some places actually get pieces of metal and turn them into like little screws. Acetone is one of those places and they need more accountants. To your surprise, you are actually qualified to do that. You and Paul Beninsky exchange a few emails. The pay isn't great. There's a union pension though. That must be cool for people who plan to live past 30. <laughs> and more importantly, the hours are flexible and you'll mostly be left alone. And since you're pretty sure Melody finagled you this job, you decide to take it. Sweet, sweet. Um, okay, let's check our phones. Nothing going on there. That's nice. Um, Rosemary Street is all healed. Let's go to the Barrows. Um, oh, I still can't. I have one dot of honor. <laughs> I seriously still can't. I still can't pour anything into the, into the, into the places. I can't, I can't do that. Why would I return to Falcon with many faces for what? Like for what? I can't do anything because I'm terrible at everything that I try and do. Hang on. Let me just, let me just see. What's Madam Mouse got? Do I already have the gift of a fairly wise, who recognizes the cunning ways and how to strike to? Yeah, can I not offer her wisdom? Or can I not have any more gifts because I'm not smart enough? It might be that. That might be the problem. Um... Do I have anything left? Free days, just three. Nah. All right. Let's check in on Black Tarn, see how she's doing. For the time, Melody has put Black Tarn up in a barrow where the swamps meet the woods. Black Tarn is from an older generation of Garu for whom surviving without human comforts is a point of pride. And I think I've read this before. Melody has given Black Tarn all the colonial era artifacts that are too quaint even for her. You pull the bevel above the white stone door late one winter afternoon and find your old mentor among gray nails, shaker furniture, and hold the, holds the Don's carved cassoni regarding a butter churn skeptically as she operates a double treadle spinning wheel. 
Finally making you that cardigan, Black Tarn says. She's wearing an ancient dress the color of autumn leaves, but it's clean despite the repair work at the hem, and her iron gray hair is carefully braided. How are you? You ask, ask, adjusting a brass mirror so it illuminates more of the little room. Diminished, Black Tarn says, chewed up by the Teufel's hand and the Umbra, a place we cannot live in anymore. Even the Garo of Broadbrook, when their temple rose like a cathedral, I feel like I've read this before, to both the true gods and the gods of human longing could not build their palaces in the Umbra. I was a fool to try. I read this. Didn't I do this already? Why is this giving me the option again? You were brave and inventive. Yeah, I did this. Yeah, yeah, I totally, totally did this already. <laughs> yeah. I was like, why is this so familiar? Um, okay, weird. How do we reach the Broadbrook Cairn? We're still trying to do that, so let's keep trying to do that. Um, you and Podge have seen the Cairn site. Yeah, let's do the Cairn site. Why are we back here again? <laughs> this will probably be the end of everything that began with your Bane hunt back in New York. God, I would love that to be true. I hope I hope you're not lying to me. Hope you're not being trickster. Like me, your scouting expeditions combined with Nin's Song of the Moon Path will let you reach the Cairn despite the tiger's tricks though the teufel's hand is still alive why didn't we kill it your pack wounded it terribly in dr vandegrift's laboratory you haven't seen it since oh yeah that's right where it like turned into a blob thing you'd prefer if it were dead but at least the night of the stolen moon and the first bane you ever encountered the one nin called tick and jat are both dead the cult of fenris is no more their mad rage won't interfere with your plans Geosir Media is a hollow shell. Neo Albion is rudderless with the death of Captain Hutchinson. Still dangerous, of course, but disorganized. And though you still don't know all the details about who hit Neo Albion around the same time you and the cult were fighting at Chemicon, you've also learned that several members of the expanded Provincial Council died alongside Captain Hutchinson. That's reduced eater of names control over the Valley's political institutions. You're as ready as you can be. Sure am. Alrighty, a break in the preparation means you and Podge can enjoy a long and comfortable dinner in the Beninsky estate while Nin is away. Oh my god, it's so romantic. Real food in the form of one of Lucinda's excellent casseroles, quiet conversation, a bit of romance. That's not who Podge normally is, and maybe he's playing a character just a little bit, but it's nice. A few hours later, you get a text from Lucinda. There's more and more news coming out of stats. Eater of Names is building something in there, and Podge calculates from the reduction in deliveries that he's almost done. You have to act now, especially given the ferocious, ever-growing protests from humans all over the valley. They've been showing up at the only public-facing entrance to stats for months, protesting, trying to get the corporate media to care, even conducting ineffective but noteworthy acts of sabotage. Dozens of arrests haven't slowed them down. It's hard not to be impressed. Nin and Podge want to use their human allies to provide a distraction. They've argued at length, Podge using theory, Nin using songs by the Pogues, that the pack should encourage the humans to fight for Gaia too. But Melody and Elton have argued that humans fundamentally do not understand what Garu fight for and that a bunch of hippies and crust bugs won't do anything except get shot. Uh, we need to reach the Cairn in one piece. I'm willing to work with the bravest human protesters. Damn, da darn tootin'. Though you don't have Roscoe, I know. <laughs> I don't have three knights of honorable Cheminage. Because I keep getting my pack hurt, so I suck. Uh, Hobble and Lucinda are ready to coordinate a small team of humans you can trust. Podge and Nin know dozens of regular humans who possess the right combination of determination, courage, and intelligence to provide a distraction as you head for the cairn, but they'll need a leader, and that leader in turn will need you to provide them with a plan. I work with Hoblin to move people into the woods. I'll have to be patient to set them up in the right places for a strike. Yes. First, you make sure Lucinda also knows what's going on. This will take both active members of the three families. Human protesters have been organizing out of a neglected faculty lounge at Smith College, so you review your maps there. We need to avoid an actual shooting war, Hoblin says. These people aren't soldiers. They need to serve as a distraction. After long hours of discussion, topography checks, Lucinda's coordination efforts, and midnight trips into the woods... Excuse me. You and Hoblin settle on a plan. The toughest protesters he knows will hang out in a currently abandoned tent city near the trail to East Hampton. An hour before you plan to strike, they'll travel down the bike path to a parking lot used by Neo Albion support personnel and, well, burn it. That'll provide an enormous distraction, drawing militarized police away from your entry point and buying you time. The town's Christmas decorations, feeble this year after so much political strife, start to come down as a rather mild January gives way to a cold and windy February. 
Since you bear the magic wand, <laughs> your next consideration is when to call a meeting of all the Garu. Succeed or fail, live or die, you doubt this final battle will take more than a few nights. I need my bow to keep enemies at bay because I have three dots in aim, and I think that's probably the best one for me. No reason to charge into battle until you absolutely have to. Your bow has better range than David Beninsky's dwindling supply of knives, and the silver arrows are especially deadly against Fomori and other monsters. Your little pack of six Garu spends its time training for the attack, monitoring police and the Bane activity across the valley, and trying to learn more about what Eater of Names is doing at the Cairn. You and Hoblin monitor the humans he plans to take with him, weeding out potential informants or troublemakers. You all, you're also responsible for choosing a location for the final meeting place since everyone else has been so busy monitoring the cairn. You plan to act tomorrow. Today, everyone needs to know where to get dinner. Oh my god, let's have dinner at our place. Me and Podge will cook. <laughs> so stupid. Podge has gone all out, covering the decaying mansion's ancient dining room table in a checked tablecloth he dug out of the dumpster behind Cavaletti to go, and ordering actual steaks from the fancy Argentinian place. You don't know if he paid in cash or favors, but as you work your way through a plate of fried artichokes, oh god, that sounds so good, you realize that your companions are pensive despite the bounty laid out before them. The feast has the air of a last meal. Tonight, we dine in hell. Chapter 11, what's the time? <laughs> My watch has stopped. That's a great... Uh, title for a chapter the moon cannot contain such fires all is destroyed the quest for the tao ends the book of Chu uh, chuang tzu yeah here we go here we go here we go i'm so ready i'm so ready are these old maps melody asks elton as he hands some old papers to you in black tarn who never saw the cairn before its fall I've redrawn them from memory, some 20th century records and some old photos, Elton says, as you examine the maps. It's a humble affair, just a few outbuildings and some paths. There's no enchantment in this paper. Is this stats now? Nin asks. Yeah, the fake hotel Northampton should be right there, Elton says, pointing. I want that place gone, Podge says. Who doesn't, Melody says, but we're a little busy. You continue to fixate on the physical, Patrick, Elton says. This is a battle of information. Eater of Names is planning to franchise his operation. He wants to destroy our cairn, yes, but he's doing it at least partially to show that he can. And then he'll spread more lies, drown the world in confusion and ignorance as he finishes the job of killing Gaia. We need to know everything about the Answering Tiger if we're going to stop that. We need our cairn back, Melody shouts. That's what all of this is about, right? We're not doing anything until we have a place to do it from. Black Tarn opens her mouth to offer what she no doubt thinks will be a sensible compromise. That's when a three-way argument breaks out at the table. Nin nudges you as if it's your job to prevent the three more ideologically committed Garu from tearing themselves apart. Of course, you've been doing this since you were a cub, so maybe it is. Uh, da, 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 da. this is going to happen everywhere unless we stop it here, and we need to understand Eater of Names if we're going to stop him. Oh, uh, yeah. A moment of silence, as if you just cracked an off-color... <laughs> as if you just cracked an off-color joke instead of explained your position. And then they go back to arguing as if you just asked for more roast eggplant rather than offering a final judgment. But the flashes of rage are gone, and maybe it's a good thing that the pack isn't relying on the girl who showed up half-frozen in Elton's Alley after hitchhiking out of New York. At least that's what I think. But I'm also worried that the Garu are stalling for time. The plans are all made, right, Sierra? Nin? We've been working on them for weeks, Nin tells me as I swirl under the table, leaving little cracks of static electricity in my wake. Which means they're stalling again. Despair is better than the Fenris madness that turns Garu into foolish monsters. But it's a threat that must be guarded against. Sierra, get them back on track. And make sure the fragment of the portrait frame is safe. Nin, come with, we come with me. We must discuss how to deploy the Song of the Moon Path and what you've learned about the Answering Tiger to help reach the cairn. Oh, God. The Galliard takes Black Tarn and follows the Stormcat out the main door. You check your backpack. The chunk of frame is there. Though your companions seem to have ignored you, the argument slowly bends in your direction as Elton slowly convinces Melody and Podge that they have to go to the Cairn to get what he wants, and they'll inevitably fight Neo Albion there. They should be able to accomplish their goals on the way. While the tension drains out of the room and the group pours over the maps, you catch a flicker of movement on a laptop that monitors the road outside. The Stormcat might be warping the cameras. There's a big line of cars outside, but that doesn't make you nervous. Slowdowns are frequent on the road outside as Northampton empties out after work hours. 
But, but, there's also a delivery van that draws your attention. You pause the feed. But, but. Two buts. I was going to order from that catering company, Podge says, pointing at the van. They had an event here yesterday and another one down in Holyoke today. What are they doing here then? Melody asks. They're not, Podge says. This camera feed is from yesterday. You conjure your silver bowl and run to a boarded up window. That's when your phone rings. It's Hobland. Sierra, get out here, he shouts, his voice staticky. We're in woods. Haven't seen Lucinda moving. Now where you are, the call drops. Neo Albion is moving through the snowy garden, positioning themselves to surround the house. Whoopsies. You count 20 troops heading your way, armed with M16s and wearing ceramic armor designed to stop claws. And if you've learned anything about Neo Albion, they are snipers farther away, armed with crossbows. There are snipers. They wear metal masks and their eyes glow blue-green in the darkness. Some carry breaching pods, while four more bring up the rear with heavy explosives of some kind. Incendiaries? You're not sure. But you know that if they reach the estate, this place is turning into an inferno. Weapons, Podge says, making sure everyone has a pistol. You get a Smith & Wesson 45, no doubt stolen from the state police barracks. That won't punch through armor, but it's heavy enough to knock a man down. Only Melody refuses a firearm. Graynell flickers at the edge of your perception, eager to add his strength to your machete. Raccoon will help here. <laughs> Raccoon, I choose you. Um... Ooh, stay back. I'm going to engage the... How hurt am I? Am I fine? I'm fine. Okay. Stay back. I'm going to engage them with my bow before they reach the estate. Ta -ta! <laughs> you bang through the main door with your pistol raised. A th I, love the I love that I have three dots in aim and I just want to use it as much as possible because it's, it's, it's actually kind of always worked out pretty well. Kind of. A three-round burst cracks, but that's too far away. You stay low and ignore it, then spot four guards moving through the winter garden. You shoot twice, catch one in the eye and one on the side of the knee. They both go down. Then Podge opens fire, dropping the other two. Somewhere, Melody is howling and hacking. You keep moving towards the fallen guards, grab an M16, check to make sure it's set to rifle fire, not the shotgun. Another three-round burst flies past your head. You spot the shooter and return fire, killing him. Three more are closing in, trying to get into shotgun range. That's when Elton rushes out of the darkness. His leaven bolt vaporizes them. A final sickening crunch as Melody brings her axe down one last time. That's the last of them. Look at us! You obviously can't stay here. Leaving the dead, you and your pack hurry deeper into the woods until you reach the remains of an old battlefield that you explored when you first came to Northampton. Of course, that's not really what you're doing, is it? I hope you can hear me, Sierra. God's fucking Stormcat. Because I can't see you. Eater of Names is watching, calculating, determining how you'll act. You can't be predictable here, or we need to move, Elton shouts, and his voice echoes until your ears feel like they're going to bleed. We have to reach the cairn while there's still time. You need to. Don't tell the tiger who you really are, Sierra, don't. Right, you need to tell everyone your plans for approaching the cairn, Christ. This is fine. This is good. This is good. This is fine. Um, This is good. This is good. Let's do a knot, Sierra. What? <laughs> All right. Uh, go mind games, I know. Where's the mind games? <sighs> Alright. This is bad. I have to okay, so do something that's unpredictable to the tiger you really are. Don't do something that's predictable. Don't be predictable. I'm like, I'm like, yay, yay, humans. I love humans, right? Yeah. So... Let's hit the perimeter hard, kill as many humans as we can. That seems like the least Sierra thing to do, so let's do that one. Podge nods and says, We've already shown that we can take out their kill teams, even when we're boxed in. Let's see what happens when we have the element of surprise. I'm glad to keep my axe busy, Melody says, but how do we get in? You already know, you say, because you've worked with Melody and all of them for months laying the groundwork for this plan. But I, I want to hear it in your words, Melody says. How are we getting into the cairn? Oh, this is weird. This is weird. This is weird. Yes, we want your advice, Elton says. Tell us how, Podge says. Yes, Sierra, Elton says. Tell us, Sierra, Podge says. Sierra, Melody says. Stripes crawl across your world as the answering tiger roars in frustration, then pulls away. Oh, God, I hate it. Sierra, Melody shouts, shaking you. Sierra, she looks about ready to hit you with her axe. You check your leather coat. The magic wand is tucked into the interior pocket. You're still downstairs in the Beninsky estate. A few seconds have passed. 
You appear not to have shapeshifted, though when you stare at your hands, the outlines seem to waver. What's the plan, everyone? Podge says through gritted teeth as Neo Albion closes in. Oh god, we haven't even fought Neo Albion yet. Raccoon will help here. <laughs> Oh, God. Um. <sighs> Where's Raccoon? I'm sorry, I'm looking for Raccoon, because it's saying Raccoon will help here. Don't know. We could just abandon the estate. The estate is a little lost. So we're going to sneak out one at a time. We could just abandon the estate. We could. <laughs> no, let's let's try it again. Let's do what we did. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm being I'm getting too chaos grumbling about it. Let's try do what we did again and see if it works again. <laughs> I don't want to just hang back, Melody says. Cover Sierra's flank, Elton tells the Philodox. We'll pick off anyone who gets past you two. Podge and Elton get into position as you hurry through the Winter Garden. You draw the fire the moment you're out in the open, but you duck behind a headless statue, then spot four soldiers moving through the desolate garden. You shoot the moment you have a clear shot and hit at least one, then Melody slams into them with her axe. You're seeking another target when a three-round burst misses your head by inches, followed by a silver-tipped quarrel that gets even closer. You break cover, hop over a low fence, and nearly collide with three more Neo Albion soldiers. You shoot one with your bow, and his shotgun blast goes wide, but another skims your flank. The shot burns, but you manage to knock your attacker away, then roll among the soldier's legs, making you a harder target. You close your eyes just before Elton's Levin Bolt blasts the soldier standing over you. Then you grab another Neo Albion fighter and push him right into Melody's path. Your timing is perfect. Her axe cracks his mask like it's made of porcelain and he drops. The rest of the battle is bloody, point-blank chaos. Neo Albion is dead in seconds. As the smoke clears, you see that your packmates are winded but otherwise fine. You go away, answering tiger. L annoying. Look at my health. <laughs> that was a hell of a fight. For a moment, all you can do is catch your breath and check for injuries. But then you notice the militarized police heading through the open gates of the Beninsky estate. Where are Nin and Black Tarn? Melody asks, pulling out her phone. I don't think we should be messing around on our phones, Podge says. Well, we need to find Nin or we aren't getting anywhere, Melody says. She texts question mark to the galliard. A moment later, your phone vibrates. Blood on my hands and my hands in the till. Well, that's not even grammatical, Melody says. Did she kill a cashier? Podge says. Sierra, Nin is at the 7-Eleven next to the Nor Hotel Northampton. Go get her, Elton tells you. We'll get as close to the cairn as we can, but we need her song. Um, I shift and regenerate fully. Yes, please. Your wounds heal fully. Am I out of rage? I got one rage. I'm good. The city is in bloody chaos. Riots and protests have left at least two people dead. You can tell because you passed them on the way here. One got picked up by mourners. The other is in the middle of the street and cops are shooting at anyone who gets close. The other one might even still be alive. You can't tell and you don't have time to find out. Elsewhere, protesters sit physically and mentally beaten, zip-tied, and left on the freezing sidewalks, guarded by sullen police officers or wild-eyed private militia members who have been hastily deputized. The occasional pop of gunfire in the distance. Parts of King Street are still open, including the 7-Eleven next to the Hotel Northampton. A line of cars wraps around the block. People are getting gas and getting out. The door slides open and warm, sticky air blankets you. The clerk looks at you, then quickly returns to the long line in front of him. You knock on the bathroom door. Nin opens it. It's red inside from the blood on the light bulb. Nin, wearing only boxer shorts and a secret stairways t-shirt, stands over a middle-aged woman with her throat torn open. She hands you her ID, Massachusetts State Police, then her weapon, a revolver with silver bullets. I killed her, Nin says. I killed her twice. I killed her the first time, and then we beat Eater of Names, but then I realized it was a lie, and I killed you. I'm sorry. It was the only way I could think of to get out, to get out of the answering tiger. I'm so tired, Sierra. I've been doing this for so long. I don't want to do it again. Oh, God. Poor Nin. Too many damn hunters in this town. <laughs> the Cairn is safe, Nin says. Then she blinks. Who are you? Nin, you say? For a moment, you can see stripes gliding across her radiant eyes, and then she suddenly grabs your arm like she's drowning. Sierra, she says. I'm sorry, my attention wandered for a moment. I'm sorry about the dead woman. She isn't a Fomor, right? I thought I was fighting a Fomor. 
There's no evidence that the woman was anything other than a normal human, but you probably don't need Nin worrying about that. You stuff Nin into a spare poncho. It's a weird way to phrase that. Scrub some blood out of her hair. Why is everyone always scrubbing me? I have better than average hygiene for a werewolf or a musician. And get her back to the parking lot of the 7-Eleven, where the gas line has grown so it now stretches all the way down past Ernie's garage to the Duncan. That's when Nin snarls. You see it too with your owl eyes. The telltale flicker of the Teufel's hand. Great! As it prods at the three dimensions of your world. Though dreadfully wounded in Dr. Vandegrift's laboratory, it still lives. Of course it does, why wouldn't it? And its moth-like limbs are sweeping through the air above the 7-Eleven. Even Nin can't simultaneously track the remaining three or four limbs at once. And the people crowded between the glass pump and the glass door, of course, won't see it until it attacks. Uh, all right, calling on Squirrel. I get out of there as fast as I can and encourage Nin to do the same. I don't want to... Let's go. You tell Nin. I don't want to do this by just by her. Poor Nin is already like fragile at the moment. I don't want it just to be her, me and her dealing with this. Let's go. You tell Nin. Bolting under the Hotel Northampton sign and putting a fence between you and the 7-Eleven. Screams and shouts behind you as the Galliard takes off in her lupus form, pulling out ahead of you as she lopes through the hotel parking lot. You can't shift as fast as Nin can, but you can almost keep pace in your glabro form. The air boils as Teufel's hand claws seek you out as the monstrous thing drags itself through extra dimensional space. But you and Nin scatter, the Galliard accelerating fast through the lot while you sprint around the edge of the hotel building. A claw sweeps for you, but you slide under a park delivery truck, and when you come out the other side, the Teufel's Hand, trying to attack everyone at once, has reached its maximum extension. It can't reach you. You keep running until you're back on Main Street. You slide under a parked van, then poke your head around the back. The cops are running the wrong way, up toward Main Street. A moment later, you spot the 7-Eleven crowd fleeing up through the parking lot between the 7-Eleven and Ernie's garage. It looks like they got away, too. Nin yips. You need to keep going. The Cairn is northwest of town, the Northampton Police Headquarters is just south of the 7-Eleven and the Northampton, and there is a Massachusetts State Police Station on North King Street. North of your location, so Nin slices right through the burbs heading for the bike trail. Okay. That's cool. Ah. Behind you, the last snow-covered split level on the sleepy suburban road. In front of you, trackless woods that have lead eventually to Stats, Broadbrook, and the Defiled Cairn. Nin starts to sing. Between it and the piece of frame from the painting of Elton, you should be able to reach the Cairn without drawing the attention of everything between here and the false Northampton, Hotel Northampton. You and Nin step into the woods. I'm waiting there, my host body's feet not quite leaving prints in the icy snow. But I don't want to stay here for long. The others have already gotten as close as they can to the cairn. Now all everyone needs is Nin's song, so let's not waste any more time. The Galliard shifts into her massive hispo form and howls. The forest shifts, changing without changing. As constellations might change even as the stars remain fixed. New possibilities and configurations unfurl in your mind. And then Nin is off at a run, heading for the cairn. You follow her song, then her huge tracks in the muddy snow until the trees end. This isn't the route you took to the false Hotel Northampton with Podge. A vast, desolate field of mud and snow stretches beyond the forest, hundreds of clear-cut acres to make way for the expanse of stats. The false city is visible now, a black expressionist knife that reaches up towards the stars, dominated by a false city hall and false first church of, church of Northampton, their spires still covered in metal scaffolding. Anything that isn't brown is orange. Construction fencing, barrels, cones, the occasional flashing warning light, flares burn in trenches or atop concrete pylons. The tracks lead through the cold mud to two human corpses hacked to death from behind. You search the men's pockets but don't find wallets or weapons. But you examine the tracks around the dead men in the pale light of the crescent moon. Their tracks lead toward the east entrance. You follow another pair, pair of tracks back and see how the weight changes. You recognize Melody from the stride length and the indentations. She shifted into her glabro form about 20 feet out and axed them, searched them. She dragged them around a little and then hurried for the eastern entrance to Stats, retracing the men's steps. Then you hear low arguing, women's voices. That's Melody and Black Tarn. Staying low, you crunch through the snow wasteland until you reach them. No, they were definitely guards, Melody says. Doesn't matter now, Black Tarn says. Let's get to the entrance. I heard Nin, Melody says. Melody, Blacktarn, 
you say. Melody Glabroform jumps, but Black Tarn Hamid is already waving for you to join them. Is that really you, Sierra? Melody says. The answering tiger got Melody for a while, Black Tarn says. She's okay now. I thought it worked, Melody says. My plan should have worked. Except now I can't remember what it was. I remember our victory celebration afterwards, though. I think I might have killed some people who weren't Neo Albion. I think I did the same thing I did last time at the Battle of Graves Farm. Except this time I'm not going to run away. Uh, unless I'm running away now. Which way are we going? <laughs> My god. We're heading for the east entrance of Stats, you say, gesturing past tree stumps and construction equipment to the fence. This is where humans stage their protests, but it's below freezing and close to midnight, so it's quiet now. Melody and Black Tarn are dressed in ragged parkas and disposable maxi dresses and cheap boots. Black Tarn is forged ahead, sniffing for Nin, but the Galliard's howls are far away now. Melody can't seem to focus. The answering tiger captured her for multiple subjective days, and she's having trouble adjusting. You carefully get her moving until you reach a fence. What the hell? There shouldn't be a fence here. Oh my god, please help me. Especially not a 20-foot reinforced metal fence topped with concert concertina wire. He keeps trying to catch me, a familiar voice says, but I already know how sin and pales this world is. His tricks don't work on me. Oh, this is Giselle. I thought it was answering Tiger. Giselle stands in front of the fence. It's 50 yards of no man's land between the fence and the false city. I know you're there, Sierra, Giselle shouts. Actually, she whispers it, but the words travel right to you. It's always funny what I can do with the slightest effort of will. You must do through painstaking ritual that reinforces your monstrous society's brutal hierarchies of control and submission. Songs, spirits, bits of infernal em ephemera carried like icons. Isn't it tiring? The answering tiger is watching us. I'm not afraid. Are you? What do you want? <laughs> what do you want? What do you want, Giselle? Power, Giselle says with an indifferent shrug as if she couldn't possibly want anything else. She lights a cigarette, cupping her hands against the winter wind so her pale face turns red gold for a moment, then exhales slowly, eyes closed, as if to show she's unafraid of you. Smoke rises from the heavy muffler around her throat, turning her face hazy until the wind carries it away. God has given me authority over his angels, his fallen angels as well. That's why I'm here. While you poor deluded creatures blunder around and kill each other in the web of the answering tiger's lies, I'm going to take him and make him serve me. I've met humans like you before, Black Tarn says. They try and seize what's ours. Usually they die before we can even stop them. I'm old, Giselle. I've seen witches come and go. I've learned to pity them. The crack crack of automatic weapons fire from somewhere beyond the fence. Elton and Podge, or are the guards shooting at protesters? Giselle doesn't react. What the hell are you doing here, Giselle? Melody says. Hanging around and seeing how it all plays out, the witch says with a shrug. Same as your sister always did, Melody. Melody snarls. Do you think Harmony followed you out of a sense of loyalty? Of love? Giselle says with a cruel laugh. Werewolves smash through everything they encounter, and the clever witch digs through what's left. That's how you found the magic wand, <laughs> isn't it? If you hadn't grabbed it, I would've. And with you, I don't even need to give you instructions. You're about to charge right into your cairn and attack Eater of Names. Maybe you'll succeed, maybe you won't. I win either way. Would you like some advice before you charge me? Melody's eyes are cold and hard as she shifts her weight, eager to sink her axe into Giselle's face. But Black Tarn just looks annoyed. She regards Giselle as a distraction and a pointless threat. <laughs> Go away, Giselle. You can't sit with us. Achievement. Lose the wolf. Reach rage zero. Great. You have temporarily lost the wolf. Why? You and Black Tarn. Did she take it from me? You and Black Tarn get Melody away from Giselle. Melody never breaks eye contact as the witch smokes her cigarette. You keep moving until you can't smell Giselle's Chesterfields anymore, then consider the fence. I need my wolf back, please. The three of you turn to confront the fence. It appears to run for miles here, north and south. Black Tarn sniffs the ground, sniffs the fence, then stands up and walks through it. Tyga lies, she mutters as the fence fades away and she heads deeper into the wasteland between the forest and stats. I knew that. Melody mutters, following. Rage Zero is a great state to be in before the final mission. I know. I know it is. I'm the best. Um, it's going to be super fine. Uh, <laughs> 
The No Man's Land is, bl is a blighted waste of stumps, traffic cones, and frozen mud. Nin's howl draw draws you onward. Then you step abruptly into downtown Northampton. The fake one, of course, the police training facility. It's expanded since you were last here. You're south of Elton's flat near the false town's copy of GRC Media. No one bothered to run a bunch of werewolves through the GRC Media building to make it more accurately ref reflect the real structure. This exact area is Holly Street, a suburban row perfect for practicing raids on family houses. The only problem is that removing the trees has triggered mudslides and caused the boggy land around here to settle. Two houses have collapsed completely and all but one lists at an angle. They haven't paved the road yet and wooden walkways help you get over muddy streets. Sierra! Podge calls from the second floor of the only level house. Elton pops the front door open and waves you inside. New clothes on both Garu. They probably spent some time in Krinos form. There are a lot of dead people somewhere. What kept you? Elton asks. Giselle, Melody says. You kill her? Elton asks. Asked her politely to leave, Melody says. She'll be back, Black Tarn says. If I know witches, Giselle wants to bottle a demon. What demon? Elton asks. The answering tiger, Black Tarn says. Podge whistles. You lean out the window and spot Nin, who's making her way across the telephone lines towards the house. The huge wolf drops down onto the muddy ground. She spits out gore, then licks her red teeth. She's been even more busy since you saw her outside the 7-Eleven. Okay, Elton says once everyone's assembled. We're going to slip past the east security gate because the humans protest there, and while there is a security presence, they expect to see humans moving around. No reason to waste time here, Melody says. Are we all ready? Me and Esmeralda are ready to rock, Podge says. Esmeralda, Melody says. My crossbow, obviously, Podge says, holding up the huge crossbow he took from Neo Albion. The Arun appears to have one silver-tipped quarrel. The path is muddy and cold, but you don't see anyone. Not a lot of light except the crescent moon and the occasional orange road flare. Snow falls, but doesn't stick. Trunks dot the false and muddy streets. Cold and muddy. This is why I could never be a country wolf. This sucks. <laughs> Fucking awful weather. Maybe when this is all over, you can see if Gaia needs protection in New Mexico or something. <laughs> Amazing. At least there's no freezing rain tonight, but Eater of Names has trashed this landscape. And with stats, uh, with this stats project, it'll take years to fix it, assuming any of you survive. I remember this place, Melody says, as Nin leads the way down a dark and empty facsimile of Market Street, past the pizza place that's Mexican-themed for some reason. In this false reality, it's just a one-story corrugated metal shed. This is where we sentenced David Beninsky to death. What do you mean, we? Podge says. Well, it's not like I had a say, Melody says. Blame is pointless now. But it was Holds the Dawn and Grey Nail who ordered his execution. If there's one place where it all went wrong, this is it. But Nin, is, oopsies, but Nin is already forging ahead, hopping over rooftops despite her massive size. You follow until you reach the eastern security, security barrier. The entrance isn't far from the truck-eating bridge and the sushi place where you scavenge for rice in the real world. Beyond the bridge, Main Street, and then a right turn to the Hotel Northampton and the Cairn. There's a hastily erected tower atop the bridge in this false reality where the train tracks are. The crossbow snipers up there can see for miles. You're lucky they haven't already spotted you. Below them where Byzance is in the real Northampton, more Neo Albion soldiers wait. The whole area is lit up and Neo Albion carries its now familiar M16s with silver shotgun attachments. They don't know you're coming right now, but they're ready for werewolves. That's a fucking kill zone is what that is, Podge says, pointing a steel-tipped quarrel at the barricade under the bridge. Well, we don't have time to wander around and look for another way in, Elton says. Eater of Names already knows we're here after we... After we ripped up those cops. Yeah, I was here for that, Al, Podge says. After about five minutes of discussion, during which time you offer wide-ranging advice on how these streets are laid out, at least the real ones, your pack identifies four possible ways to deal with Neo Albion. You want to act fast before a larger force has time to identify your location and send reinforcements. First, you could work as Podge's spotter while he picks off snipers. The Arun has weapons for every conceivable engagement distance short of an artillery bombardment. You'd have to serve as his eyes, which would take great care and patience, something we're known for. Second, rather than getting into a shooting battle, you and Nin could climb up from the second story of the sushi place onto the rail line beneath the tower. Snipers wouldn't have a chance against Nin at point-blank range, and if you're smart, you won't even have to fight anyone. You could just unlock the door on the far side, then sneak everyone through one of the buildings. They'd never even see you. 
Third, there's an old Chevy station wagon parked on the sidewalk. It appears to still be functional, so you could sneak up to it and hotwire it. You can't drive, but Elton can, and he could smash through the barricade. Then everyone else could run on through you as you draw fire. Finally, Black Tarn seems confident that she can deal with Neo Albion. You're about to tell her it's foolhardy when she just laughs at you and says, I've dealt with worse, Sierra. All right, if you say so, Black Tarn, deal with the guards and then catch up. I mean, it's one of those things where, like, Black Tarn is clearly old, and I love her, and I think she's great, but, you know, if she dies, I'm fine with it. I honestly didn't expect her to make another appearance, so. Gladly, Black Tarn says, when you hear screaming, run for the barricade. She walks without fear down the street. Your pack tenses as Neil Albion will notice her in a second. Then the old fury raises her clawed hands. Her claws fly into the air, glittering red-black in the floodlights, and then fly like wasps onto the roof of the fake restaurant where they rip into the snipers. Her targets scream and fall. When the crossbow snipers try to take aim, Black Tarn gestures with her right hand and more claws fly straight up, then rip into them. Ah, oh, wicked, Elton says. Run, Melody shouts. Everyone follows Nin up and over the barricade. An alarm sounds and the lights turn from white to red, but you're already through. When you look back, you spot Black Tarn racing laterally away from you, drawing all the attention. She'll waste their time all night, probably. And you're through. Awesome. <laughs> best adult. Yeah. Yeah. Best grandma ever. The Hotel Northampton rises in bleak artificial majesty, a cheap prefab copy of the Federalist original, precise down to the last inch, but shoddy and synthetic, existing only for live fire and ked kettling practice. You remember Eater of Name's face in the window of the lobby. There's nothing here, a spiritual void, but the parking lot is full. This is it, Podge asks, even though he was here with you not too long ago. This is the cairn, Melody says. She sounds tired and not just from all the action you two have seen tonight. Everyone hesitates even though Neo Albion must be closing in. You climb the steps and walk into the lobby. Ghosts at the edge of your vision, the faintest edge of a presence granted by the same razor right that lets you see Broadbrook spirits. Though are you sure ghost is the right word? That is an interesting term in English, isn't it? I ask as I hop onto the reception desk and weave through shades so pale they do not quite have locations, though they are vaguely in the lobby. A ghost in the graveyard, a ghost in the trinity, a ghost in the meat. Evening, Stormcat, Black Tarn says. What are these shades? Oblivion, not just existence, has its kinds and its genre. Eater of Names and the Answering Tiger have started to disagree about the manner of the world's ending. These shades are the Answering Tiger trying to make this place like the real place. To bring down the barrier between the true and the false. To make himself into the real Gaia and Gaia into a shadow. That's his dream. But Eater of Names wants only execution, of humanity, of thought, of life. He regards the Tiger's ambitions as an essential betrayal of their shared oath to the spirit of destruction. To him, the tiger's dreams to replace Gaia are akin to casting down a tyrant, only to raise up a new one in her place. The Black Spiral Dancer has been busy these past few months, digging through your trash, building something that can destroy the cairn. The tiger has been busy too, preparing for its reification. These shades, the portrait of Elton, the corpses in the Connecticut River you saw when you spoke with Eater of Names. Sierra, these are all the answering tiger preparing to make his lies real. So what the hell do we do? Podge says, edging away from a ghost family, checking into the Simulacrum Hotel. It's nice of you to listen to the spirits for once, Podge, but I fear I'm too involved with the situation to offer a clear course of action. Let me summarize what might come to pass. If Eater of Names tears the cairn apart, I will die, and Broadbrook will cease to be a sacred site. Though, of course, a cairn is best understood as a door between worlds. The power lost to you will go elsewhere. No, the real horror of such an event is that if Eater of Names lives, he will know what to do what to do to the next Cairn, and the one after that. You've read his book, Sierra. You know what he that he wants to spread his program of annihilation. And he will. The answering tiger devouring the can is, perhaps, even worse. I don't know if he can become Gaia or become God, but he will be stronger than anything the Garu can face. So what do we do? Melody asks, trying to keep despair out of her voice. Can we call on the spirits of the Cairn in any way? We have all the allies we're going to get, Elton says. He tries not to sound miserable. <clears throat> what 
Well, if this is the end, I plan to meet it at my home. I head for the stairs that lead up. Your companions fan out, running their hands over the cheap particle board and artificial ferns of the lobby, remembering that this pla- what this place used to be before the coming of the bra- black, spir- bra- black spiral dancer. Distant gunshots outside, but they must be a quarter mile away or more. Are you checking in? The shadow of the front desk clerk asks Podge. Uh, yeah, Podge says. Reservation unto Taiga, answering. I don't see that name for tonight, sir. The vague blur shivers and reforms. Are you checking in, sir? We're not getting anything out of these chat bots, Podge says. Let's go. You keep expecting more security, but you haven't seen anything since the East Barricade. No Neo Albion or regular cops, no mutated Fomori, and in all your time in the valley, you've only met the one Black Spiral Dancer, though they normally travel in packs. You don't want to take the same route up as the Stormcat, but if this place matches the real hotel, there should be another stale wall on that far side of one of the event rooms. You push open the double doors and find yourself, not in a banquet hall, but a shooting range. Wooden barriers divide up the room. The smell is ghastly, and despite the cold, as there's no heat on the ground floor, flies rise up when you enter. Dead dogs have been left where they were shot to death. Ugh. There's a broad range of animals from a big golden retriever lying across a wooden barricade to a pair of nearly obliterated chihuahua corpses huddled in one corner. That's the worst imagery ever. From the state of decomposition, they're three or four days old. You hear yelps and whines from what should be the coat room in the real hotel. Nin snarls, then bolts. She bangs through the door to the false coat room, and you hear a short scream, then a crunch. When you hurry through the obstacle course to the coat room, you see Nin standing over an NPD officer with her throat torn out. The dogs in here are going crazy. This is some kind of kennel attached to the shooting range with dozens of animals of all sizes and all conditions trapped in cages. I don't know. God, my throat is... I don't know how much more we have of this, but I think I'm going to stop it right here. Even if the the final part is short, I will finish it off because my... Again, I've... I feel like I've read so much and my throat is already given out. My voice is already given out. So we're going to stop right here. Obviously, we're going to attempt to save the animals, but also obviously make sure that they're not Fomori because that's the first thing I thought of and it makes me really nervous. I don't want to fight Fomori golden retrievers. I might never, ever be able <laughs> to sleep again. Um, but yes, uh, we're so close to the end. I want to, I hope we save the cairn. I'm scared. But that's a good thing. And thank you everyone so much. I hope you have an amazing weekend. And we'll, we'll finish this next week, I promise. Bye, everyone.